Hey, today we're going to talk about how you can avoid mistakes on Ancestry's tree. Now, specifically, we're going to be talking about member trees. We're going to talk about uh, how to avoid accidentally creating duplicates in your family tree. We're going to talk a little bit about hints and how they're not everything. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about um, some things you should know about through lines. And then we're going to talk about uh, ethnicity estimates and well, all of that coming up next. Hey, welcome back to another episode on Genealogy TV. My name is Connie Knox. I am a lifelong genealogist here to help you go further faster and factually with your family history research. Now, genealogy is a blast. We all have fun doing this, and sometimes it's very easy to import things into our tree that might not be exactly accurate to our family history. So we're gonna talk about how to avoid some of those mistakes coming up in just a minute. If you are not a subscriber, I hope you'll subscribe and ring the bell so that you get notified each time I upload a video. Genealogy TV has a website, a newsletter, and a Facebook page. Links for all of that are in the description box below the video on the YouTube channel. Now, I would also like to point out that this is not sponsored by anybody. Uh, this is not sponsored by Ancestry or, or anybody else. It's just me putting this out there. So uh, your support is always appreciated. And speaking of that, handouts are available for the uh, information access level channel members, for the patrons at Patreon, and or you can just buy them over there at Genealogy TV. There is a handout for this episode. All right, let's jump over to the computer and learn how to avoid some of those mistakes. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is member trees and how you get there is if you're in a profile for your ancestor and you click over on the hints, at the very top of the screen, the first thing they give you is other ancestry member trees. And I, I don't understand why Ancestry does this because I really wish it would be the last thing on the list because you really should be checking out the documents first. In the hints, some of those hints are being delivered because of member trees because other members have brought those documents in and said that they belong to this ancestor. And in some cases, the algorithm is also pulling information from uh, the records and, you know, they're pulling that the data out of the records using optical character recognition or OCR. So they're pulling that data out. But also as members are saying, yes, that's the record that belongs to my ancestor, all of that information together is delivering hints to uh, your ancestor's profile in the in the view of a, of a leaf that you see on the family tree, right? So when we go over to hints, though, the first thing that we see is ancestor member trees. Well, that's the first thing I ignore. That's the last thing I'm going to look at, and I'll tell you why. I'm going to hit ignore on this, right, and make it go away, because the first thing I want to do is research the the records, but that's not what we're here to talk about. What we're talking about here is how you can make mistakes using member trees. And that's another reason why I use member trees last. But let's jump over to a different ancestor. So here I had previously ignored a uh, member tree hint. And, and now it's in undecided because I had unignored it. So if I went over here and I said, don't ignore, it is now popping up over undecided which I thought was interesting because it used to put it back into the new tab, but it's not. All right, so let's go look at the member trees here for Robert S. Dunbar. So we're gonna review this. And so this is where we need to be careful because if we're not, we can accidentally add ancestors to our trees that are end up being duplicated. And this is a probably one of the more common mistakes I see. So here we have another other, let's look, 10 member trees, and then my tree on this side. So what a lot of people do, they're going to go, hey, let's just make it easy. Instead of selecting over here and saying review selected tree hints, sometimes they're just saying select them all and then review the tree hints. And I'm going to show you the difference right now. So 
Let's not select them all. Let's just select the first one. And by the way, when you first see these, the top one usually has the most sources. So what you want to pay attention to is sources and records. Photos are fun. Stories are fun. You know, it just depends on what you find. But you want to, you want to be reviewing these, these records to see exactly uh, what the details are, right? Exactly where are they getting this information? How do they know that these are the parents? How do they know that these are the children? Now, in my case, on this particular ancestor, I have some of that information already. By scrolling down, you can see that I'm not selecting this second member tree. And they have 15 records here, whereas this one has 17 records. So what they're doing is they're populating the, the, the family tree, the other member tree, with the most records to the top of the list. So let's review this. So what we're going to do, now remember, we're only picking this one tree. We're not selecting all. So we're going to hit Review Selected Tree, hints. And once it populates, we can, you know, select specific information. For example, here's a date that is different. We can select specific information, which is fine if we have documentation for that. But the problem is when we just wholesale add stuff, what proof do we have that that is that fact is correct. Show me the money, right? Where's the documentation? So I'm not going to do that, but I'm just showing you that's one mistake that you can make. If we scroll down a little bit, you can see that here is Elizabeth Dunbar. I have Eliza. It could be Eliza and Elizabeth are two different people. She could have gone by Liz. She could have gone by Eliza. I don't know. I don't have any documentation again to show me that this is true. What if everybody attached themselves to this tree and it was wrong? That would become a train wreck, right? Okay, so I scroll down a little bit farther and this says children of Robert S. Dunbar and Martha Jane Rogers. Well, that is the the wife, the spouse that I have in my tree. But according to this member, if we scroll down, other children of Robert S. Dunbar and Elizabeth Dunbar. So this is implying that there's another spouse that I don't have, okay? Scrolling back to the top, I can see my own information up here and I show that Martha Jane Rogers is here and I can see that I have eight children right here and the first guy his name is John Rogers and he is born in 1845 okay hold that thought so scrolling back down I find Robert S Dunbar Martha Jane Rogers have John Rogers according to this member and there is that information and I could import new information again without documentation I would like it says it's citing the source but I want to see the source. I want to agree with the source, right? So I've scrolled down to the second wife, which I don't have in my tree. I'm not saying she's wrong. I'm just saying I want to see the documentation. I don't want to just import people, okay? So here what I'm doing is I'm now it says other children. So that makes me think, okay, what other children? Well, here's another John. And he was born about, if I were to import that, he was born about 1821. Same father, two different sons by the same name, John Dunbar. Now, does it happen? Yes. Sometimes a father will have two children by the, with the same name. It has happened. But, you know, again, show me the source. And it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really show me. I, there's no way for me to click through to that source. Okay, so this is how mistakes can happen. I don't want to do it. I want to make those decisions for myself. So the last thing I want to tell you about member trees is I love ancestry members and a lot of times they're right, but a lot of times they're wrong. So don't automatically import stuff. You know, in, th in this case, this was a specific member tree. Watch what happens now if we go back and do this clicking on all of the member trees. Okay, so I'm now I'm back over where that member hint was and I'm going to hit review again. This time, instead of just clicking the first one, I'm going to select all trees and it says review selected trees and watch what happens. 
So now you got to pay attention to what you're doing here because it says review the information in your tree. But if you look closely, it says these are a combination. So what it's done is it's taken like, I think there was 10 member trees that have the same ancestor in them. And they combined them all together the best that Ancestry can. And now they're giving us some information about collectively what they think is the best information. But my point is, if one member, let's say the first member creates this information and a few pieces of it is incorrect or a marriage is um, inadvertently attached to Robert S. Dunbar that shouldn't be there, and then other members follow and other members follow and more members follow and they keep attaching themselves to the train and the locomotive is going down the track and everybody's following, right? Can you get my point? We're going to have a problem here. So, uh, you know, if, if one person makes that mistake and everybody else follows and imports, then then uh, then we have collectively a train wreck. So this is how mistakes happen. So here, if we just go click, 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 let's hurry up and import this because I'm just dying to fill out my family tree. So here's what happens. Here we've got 1854, Richmond, Salem, Jefferson County, Ohio, and a death date. Here, somebody had Mary Dunbar, 1854, same person. I guarantee you this is the same person, right? But this is going to add it as a new person, which then would become a duplicate in my tree. So we don't want to do that for sure. But that is another example of how you can have uh, duplicates popping up in your tree is when you import them by mistake. All right, last example. Here's Olive Dunbar from, from, from her mother is uh, Martha, okay? And then down here, another Olive Leah with... Martha. So there is two children by the same name. Collectively, there are 17 children I counted by doing this combination method. The combined ancestry trees, I count 17 children. I think three of them are duplicated names. Long story short, you just need to pay attention to how you import member trees. For the most part, I very rarely import member trees and Quite frankly, uh, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be the very last step. And 99% of the time, they're copying from me because I have done the reasonably exhaustive research using records and cis citing my sources and stuff. So I am confident that my tree is as good as I can make it. And then we'll find out what the other members are doing. But you know, sometimes you'll find another record or photograph or a Bible record or something because that other member is a direct descendant of somebody really close, but most of the time, not so. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is hints, and I'm going to tell you right off the top, hints are not everything, and one of the reasons why is because those hints in those in those leafy hints, that's just the low-hanging fruit that's available to you, and so... I'm going to walk you through a quick little method that I use to find everything. Okay. So let's just start with this view. So if we look at Nels here, uh, he has, uh, you know, leafy hints as do all of these people. These little blue dots mean that there's a through line available because I have my DNA attached to this tree. And so I'm seeing those blue dots on some of my ancestors. In fact, quite a few of them. Then there, this is kind of another form of a hint right here where you have the potential fathers and mothers uh, to take you back another generation. So the way that Ancestry's algorithm is working is it's pulling from a lot of places. It's pulling from the records, pulling from the member trees if we talked about, and it's delivering it to you in a variety of different hints. Okay, so let's go take a look at Nels here and look at his profile. First of all, when you pop this up, it does give you that there's four hints here and that there is a through lines here, which you can then click through and see the through lines, a totally different uh, type of hint, if you will. We're going to talk more about that in a little bit. So right now we're going to go look at his profile and when it pops up, 
you can see that I've already worked a little bit of this and that there are some records here and I've got some facts here. In fact, I'm going to turn off the extra family events. Long story short is we have four hints that we have not looked at. So let's go look at that. All right. So the first thing that pops up is that ancestry member trees that we've been talking about. So I'm going to ignore that. But when I do keep in mind that when you ignore these member trees, you're not deleting them. You can find them again right here. So if I ignore that and then I click over to the ignored uh, hints, the first thing on top is the member tree. So we can always come back to that later. So right now we're going to work the records that are popping up because Ancestry is giving us some clues that this is um, some real possibilities. And like I said before, it's coming from records and it's coming from uh, the possibility that maybe other, and, uh, other members have attached this record to my ancestor. So in their own tree, right? So we work these hints, right? Until they're gone. We look at them, we evaluate them, we review them, we drill in all the way. Don't just stop here, by the way. There's some good information here, but we want to drill all the way into the actual record. And in this particular case, it's very difficult to read and it's in Danish. But you get the idea, you want to drill all the way in and evaluate it for yourself. First of all, the transcription might be wrong. Um, and then you can decide yes, no, or maybe, and the maybe will then fall into the undecided category over here. So um, that is the quick and dirty way. Now, if you want, by the way, here's another trick. If you don't like this side panel, you can click through uh, to the actual record all the way by clicking here and it takes you to the full view of that hint. Okay. And then you can choose yes, no, or maybe, okay. We're going to work the, the hint, hint list for, it sounds like a hit list. We're going to, we're going to work the hint list first. Okay. Then when that is done, we're going to search from this button up here from the profile. Okay. So let's do that. When that pops up, as you can see, it's trying to give us another uh, member tree again. We've got 2,924 results for which we have done nothing. We have done nothing other than click on the search button from the profile. But if you'll notice, it has uh, filled in and pre-populated a lot of this information on the side here. Now we can edit that information by clicking the pencil icon and we can remove some of that information if we don't want any bias. For example, let's say that we didn't have 3,000 records, potential records for this ancestor, which we know that's not right. But um, let's pretend for a moment that we come up with one or two. Well, we can go in and edit this and remove all of these kids just by clicking the X from the search function. And then when we hit search, we might get more results. And in this case, we got no more results, but you get the idea. When we scroll down, this is too much information for us to digest, start using the filters on the side. So maybe we want to start with birth, marriage, and death. So then we drill that down and we go, okay, birth, marriage, and death. Well, we know he was born in Denmark, so we don't need U.S. records uh, necessarily. Doesn't mean he wouldn't be in them if he moved to the United States later. So maybe what we need to do is drill in and doing a filtered search for the location, which then gets us down to 57 record sets. Okay, we're getting somewhere. So he was born in 1806 and died in 1881. So let's get it down to just the 1800s. Now we have 34 record sets, okay? This says we have five results already in our tree and smart filtering is turned on. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what smart filtering is, you can turn this off and on. So if you turn this off, what it's gonna do is it's gonna create uh, it's going to give you more results from the same record sets that you already have. For example, if you have somebody in the 1850 census and they're already in your tree, then with smart filtering turned on, it's not going to give you any more 
results from the 1850 census. So if that person appeared twice in the 1850 census, as did several of my ancestors, uh, I would want to turn that off, okay? So we can, we can actually minimize that too. And now we can sit here and work the 35 uh, record sets that we want. So we can then scroll down and we can decide which ones we think are appropriate for our ancestor. And when we find one, then we just, we, I'm going to use this as an example. We can right click, open in a new tab, and then we can work that particular record. Okay. Okay. So we worked a search from the, the, the hints that are here. Then we did a search from up here. Now what we want to do is a search from the card catalog. And so what we're going to do is hit search and drop down to card catalog. And now we are in a fresh search. This is everything that Ancestry has. We have not uh, asked it specifically for Nels or anything. So what we're going to do now is do a search that's going to give us the best chance of finding everything that is on the Ancestry platform. And so what we can do then is search by location first. So we're going to go to Europe, drop down to Denmark. Then I'm going to pick the era. I'm going to say the 1800s in general because he lived within that 100 year span. And now we've got 54 record sets again that could be potential. So now what we can do is we can also sort by record count and we can get the best, biggest record sets at the top. So we've got member tr member photos and stuff. Then we've got, oh, look here, church records. Boy, that might be promising. So I'm going to open that up in a right right click in a new tab and then I'm coming over here and then I'm going to start typing his name. Well, as I start to type his name, his name pops up. So I'm going to click that and I'm going to let it pre-populate with all this information. So from here, I'm going to do a search, but a lot of times what I will do is I will remove a lot of information. I will remove, for example, the children so that I don't get any weird, uh, unusual. Now, in some cases I want that. So just keep that in mind, but this will give me a lot more information without the, uh, if there was a mistake with the children or something. So, uh, these records are in Danish. You should be aware of this. It says, so now I can view the records specific to that ancestor. And by the way, that's, that's him right there. So now you're getting a different way of looking at the records, uh, with Fornell's here by using the card catalog, drop down, search the card catalog. Okay. Now, once you're done with the card catalog, we've, we've searched, we've used the hints here. We've searched here. We've gone to the card catalog here and we've searched those three different ways. Now we're going to get outside of ancestry. We're going to go to family search or we're going to go to find my, I don't know, wherever my heritage, we're going to go to other places. Maybe it's the, in this case, the, the Danish archives online and search their online. They have a free, uh, online, archives there from the Danish National Archives. And so we're going to search there and we're going to do all kinds of other little research outside the ancestry box. Let's get outside the box and do some research there. So then once we're done with that, then we come back to the hints and we go search the member trees and we review what trees are available. In this case, there are two public trees that have this guy in them. They might have something that I don't, but by the time I get to this point, I probably, you know, like I said before, probably have everything they have, but I might have some stuff that, you know, I found at the Danish archives, uh, that ancestry didn't have. I may, you know, may not. Now it might be that those member trees also have some photographs or something, uh, you know, that I don't have. That would be cool. But that's the last place I'm going to check because I don't want to get biased by other people's um, opinion of what they're seeing. And so I can then also go, hey, if there's questions about something, I can reach out to some of those members and say, are you seeing it the same way I'm seeing it? You know, and you can have uh, some conversation through the messaging system. So hints are not everything, those little leafy hints. So you got to have to work it. Uh, in that fashion.
Okay, we're going to switch gears and go over to uh, DNA now. So there's two areas that we're going to talk about uh, within DNA. One is the ethnicity estimates and the other is through lines. So we're going to start with through lines. And with through lines, you can find that right here. So this is my uh, DNA results, right? And we can click through from here or we can get to it by clicking the down arrow and dropping down to through lines, okay? We click through to through lines, we get a view that looks like this, okay? And then what you do is you scroll down, right? In this case, I'm gonna pick this ancestor and drill in. Once we're there, we have the opportunity to look at a couple different things. Now we can slide this around, which is kind of cool. We can open up all of these different matches. We can drill in here. Basically what this is doing in, in this view right here is it's giving me the opportunity to see what DNA cousins might be, there's the trick, might be related to me and the through line showing exactly the path from me to that person, okay? Now, this person over here, you can see the dashed lines. There's some people that are not in my tree. And this person, however, is in my tree, this ancestor, a half great grand aunt. And then you see this other Una Smith over here. We got an Una Smith over here. This is one of the mistakes that we can make. Okay, so if I were to import this person, right, you can click on this evaluate button and watch what happens. A side panel pops up and then we can evaluate what's going on. Now, one of the mistakes that I could make is I could add her from this side panel and act and end up with a duplicate ancestor. Or the other thing I want to point out is there are no records here. There are no records showing us exactly how this person is related. Now, in this case, it was this person's grandmother. So she probably knows from personal knowledge who this person is. So that's good to know, right? But we got to be careful when we're, when we're importing. So let's, let, we'll click on the next button, see what happens. So it says, add Una Smith to your tree. So I could click on this and say, add to tree. Well, when I do that, I'm going to have two of the same person in there. I don't want to do that. Okay. So I am not going to do that. Unfortunately, I don't see a way here that Ancestry will allow me to say, match to somebody already in my tree. So let's just be mindful of that and what you could do instead is to reach out to this dna cousin and say hey and get the exact relationship here and then add her as a direct descendant of this person and then the through line would be correct so one of the things that you need to be careful of is that through lines is not perfect. Through lines is built on the back of other people's trees and so you really need to use it as a hint feature it is not, uh, it is not exact. It is not guaranteed that these through lines are accurate because it's making assumptions based on other DNA test takers and what they put in their tree. So long story short, just be careful with through lines. You can use this evaluate to eventually add somebody to your tree. But be careful that you're not adding two people. See, the, the death dates are the same, 1980, 1980. This is going to be the same person. I can almost guarantee it. So uh, let's just be mindful of that. And uh, let's jump over to ethnicity estimates. Okay, so back on the DNA homepage, we are here. And here is where you're going to find your ethnicity estimates. Let's drill into that and see my ethnicity estimates. Check it out. Okay, so when this pops up, one of the things I want to tell you is ethnicity estimates are just estimates. Please don't put any weight into exact percentages. You know, I find it just more for entertainment than it is anything else. These will change over time. So the biggest mistake that I see people making is they're making the assumption that those estimates are exact. And for example, here, I'm, this says I'm 20% Swedish in Denmark, right? Like that, that territory, if you will, that part of the globe says, well, I know that I have about 25% of my ancestry 
that directly goes back to uh, Denmark. Okay, great. But it's not perfect and it's not exact and it will change over time because these ethnicity estimates are created based on reference panels. So they've gone out there around the world and they have said, um, let's find some people who are deeply rooted in these areas and we'll use them as a reference panel and we'll go and study their ancestry and make sure that, you know, yes, it is deeply rooted to two to 500 years and et cetera, right? So they've done this, they've got a reference panel, then they compare all of us to the reference panel. Well, one of the things you'll notice is if you go from, from one service to another, say you go to MyHeritage, 23andMe, all of the others, Living DNA, they're all going to be different because they all have different reference panels and they have different algorithms. So these are estimates. I really think that they should put estimate in front of ethnicity because that is the operative word. And so, you know, while uh, ethnicity is interesting to look at and can provide us clues, uh, it it's not exact and it will change over time because what's happening is now ancestry DNA has the biggest, I mean, right now they've got over 20 million test takers way bigger than everybody else. So you're going to find more DNA cousins there. But, uh, my gut instinct is telling me that their reference panel is probably the biggest as well. Now, having said that, let me show you, uh, my ethnicity estimates from a few years ago, and I'll explain why. Okay, so here you can see uh, a screenshot. Now this one over here on the left-hand side is a screen grab from 2018 when I uh, did my ethnicity estimates then. And you can see that the, like here it's England, Wales, and Northwestern Europe. Well, now they've separated out Wales. Wales is down here, and England and Northwestern Europe is grouped together. So as time progresses, what they're doing is they are um, breaking apart these regions as they learn more and learn more and learn more. So they update these estimates about once a year, usually in late summer. And so this is um, my estimates from the late summer update. This is September 2021. And I happen to know that this one was from 2018 because I grabbed it then. So but if you'll notice 47% here, 47% here, even though they have broken out whales and this has 2%. Okay, I think I've proven my point that you can see that things are breaking apart. Here we've got Sweden. Now we've got Sweden and Denmark grouped together. I'm just saying they're starting to modify and get a little more fine tuned over time with their regions uh, across the world. If you want to see what regions they are testing, you can come down here to see this little button right here. It says, see other regions, 1500 regions. Whereas before it was like 350. Yes, it was 350. I just double checked. As you can see, there are a lot of regions around the country. You can also zoom in and see exactly what regions you belong to, but uh, you can hover over these and learn a little bit more about what regions they have. Also, I'd like to point out, they do not have every region of the world, right? There's not every part of the, the globe that they have yet. So, and there also shows you here how many, um, like 136 regions in the Americas, you know, 57 in, in Asia. So ethnicity estimates, just keep in mind that they are just estimates. Don't put a lot of weight in them. I don't. Um, it is kind of fun to play with if you click through and, you know, you can learn a little bit more about it. You can read a little bit more about it. For the most part, I don't even look at them. I really don't. Hey, I hope you learned something new today. It's always fun to do genealogy, but we want to make sure that we're doing it accurately. I want to remind you there is a handout for this episode. Links for that information are in the show notes below. And well, there are more videos over there, I think, for you to uh, learn a little bit more. So we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.